Welcome to the 2013 uh, public lecture in the series of beta lectures. It's traditional uh, to begin the lecture by uh, reminding you, if necessary, about Hans Beta, who this series honors. Beta was a member of the uh, generation of physicists who started their careers immediately after the discovery of quantum mechanics and used it uh, to answer questions that earlier physicists not only were unable to answer, but in many cases uh, never even imagined could be asked. Uh, his earliest work, his PhD research, and the research he did for the next four years or so, uh, helped lay crucial parts of the foundation of solid state physics. In 1932, he was distracted from this by the discovery of the neutron and moved into nuclear physics. In 1933, because he had a Jewish grandparent, he was fired from his position in Germany, which turned out to be a piece of good fortune for Cornell University, who hired him in 1935. And he arrived here in 1935 at the age of 28, and spent the next 70 years doing extraordinary research in physics. Uh, when he died in 2005, he had been at Cornell for exactly half the lifetime of this university. <laughs> in his early days at Cornell in the 30s, he figured out how nuclear physics accounts for the generation of energy and stars. And uh, for this work, he received the Nobel Prize in 1967. I remember his uh, remarking that the reason uh, 30 years passed between the work and the prize, uh, his, his own theory was that uh, Alfred Nobel did not like astronomy. And indeed, there was no Nobel Prize in astronomy. And uh, Beta thought that it took the Swedes uh, 30 years to persuade themselves that what he had done was physics and not a strong. <laughs> uh, during World War II, he was the head of the theory division of the Manhattan Project. Uh, after the war, he lured Richard Feynman back to Cornell for five years before Caltech uh, tore him away from us. In 1947, Beta's thesis advisor invited him to be his successor in Munich. And Hans Beta declined the offer with thanks, uh, saying that it wasn't possible for him to forget what had happened in Germany in the past 12 years. And then he wrote, still to his thesis advisor, Zomerfeld, uh, perhaps still more important than my negative memories of Germany is my positive attitude toward America. It occurs to me that I am much more at home in America than I ever was in Germany. It's as if I was born in Germany by mistake <laughs> and only came to my true homeland at the age of 28. Americans, parentheses, nearly all of them, <laughs> are friendly, not stiff or reserved, nor have as brusque an attitude as most Germans do. It is natural here to approach all other people in a friendly way. Professors and students relate in a comradely way without any artificially erected barrier. Now, my, my reaction to that, which, which I found in uh, the new biography of Beta by uh, Sam Schwaber, 
There were two reactions. One is that parenthetical interjection, <laughs> nearly all of them. Beta was always very accurate in his speech. The other was that that description of how wonderful Americans are, how wonderful American universities are, was my own experience of what it was like to come to Cornell. I never thought of attributing it to America generally. <laughs> I assumed that it was the spirit that Beta himself had instilled in the department. Anyway, I'm, I've always been very grateful to Hans Beta for making this such a wonderful place to do physics. Well, this year's Beta lecturer is Gordon Bain. And I have known Gordon since our first year of graduate school. In fact, the very first day of our first year of graduate school, when I happened to sit next to him at the opening lecture of Julian Schwinger's quantum mechanics course. Gordon immediately started talking to me as if we'd known each other for years. And uh, the conversation consisted of him starting to teach me physics. <laughs> uh, one year later, I barely passed my oral qualifying exam. I had come from mathematics. I, I didn't start in physics, so I, I was sort of starting fresh. And after the exam, the committee traditionally gives the students some advice on how to do better. And the advice the committee gave me consisted entirely of a single piece of advice. Stop spending so much time with Gordon Bay. <laughs> <laughs> I ignored this advice <laughs> for the next 56 years. <laughs> the first physics paper I published was a collaboration with Gordon, three pages long in the Journal of Mathematical Physics. Uh, for this occasion, I looked it up on Google Scholar and was very happy to see that it is still being cited. In fact, it is now my 16th most cited publication. I then thought, what will I see when I look it up on Gordon's list of publications. <laughs> <laughs> so I look up Gordon on Google Scholar. It is Gordon's 17th. <laughs> <laughs> Which means, by modern criteria, that Gordon is 6% more distinguished <laughs> than I. <laughs> anyway, he, he is an excellent choice for beta lecturer uh, for at least three reasons. One, he was a physics major at Cornell, class of 1956, and it's a special pleasure to have Cornell undergraduates come back and tell us what they've learned. <laughs> <laughs> Two, like Hobbes Beta, Gordon is a theorist of unusual breadth. He's done important work in virtually all areas of theoretical physics. Three, Gordon has actually collaborated with Hans Bethe on two important papers, which means, by the way, that I, having collaborated with Gordon on a paper, have a beta number of two. <laughs> Uh, Gordon's talk tonight uh, relates two fields that virtually nobody else would be able to contemplate together, much less give a lecture on. The standard model of particle physics and ultra-low temperature physics. Uh, his title is Quarks and Cold Atoms from the Hottest to the Coldest Places in the Universe. <laughs> Um, uh, let's see. Thank you. We need microphone technology. Uh, right. Am I plugged in? Am I on? No, you're good. Is this one? 
This one? Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, it's really a great pleasure, a, great, a tremendous honor to be uh, invited to give this year's Beta lectures here. Uh, Hans Beta, as, as I remarked in the colloquium the other day, really did more than anybody else to mentor my career and choose the direction of my science. And I think what I'm going to talk about tonight very much reflects uh, problems that he began uh, me on the road to thinking about. Uh, I should mention, apropos of Hans uh, being coming here in 1935, he uh, went to Illinois, where, where, where he was offered a job. And he then came back to Cornell and used that offer to very much improve his position at Cornell. So there's this very close connection between Illinois, Beta, and, and Cornell here. <laughs> OK. Um, now, let me remind you again about how I began to work with Hans. This was in 1970. I was a, uh, on sabbatical at the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen. And that we started working together was really an accident of my last name and Hans's last name, both beginning with the letter B. B, B. <laughs> because the way mail was distributed in Copenhagen, uh, there was only an A box and a B box and a C box and a D box and so on. I'm sure Niels Bohr had his own box back then. So anyhow, so I'm rummaging through the B box looking for my mail one day. And at that time, I was beginning to work on neutron stars with Chris Pethick. And I discovered there was a postcard addressed to Hans Beta. And who can resist looking at it? So indeed, it was a, an acknowledgment from the, paper, from the journal Astronomy and Astrophysics of a paper that he was writing on neutron stars. That was wonderful. So I learned two things from this postcard. The first, of course, was that he was working on neutron stars. And the second was that he was coming to Copenhagen. So Chris Pethick and I managed to get a copy, a preprint of the paper. I don't know how we did it. Uh, and as we began looking at it in detail, but it, was, it was concerned with neutron stars. This is a neutron star. Um, and the question was, you, you have a nice solid outside here and a liquid interior. And how do you get from here to here consistently? And so he, he had written some theory of, of the nuclei of the matter there. And Chris and I began looking at it. And being solid state physicists, we kept doing lots of little improvements in the nature of the, the way he, he was describing the material in the crust. So much so that in the end, his theory fell apart completely and was no, no longer valid. Whereupon he, he showed up in, in Copenhagen. And we told him about this. And he said, oh, yes, in that case, we must really begin to revise our whole theory of, of the nuclear physics of the crust. And neither of us knew any nuclear physics, Chris, Chris or I. And it was really quite wonderful to be initiated into this subject by, by the great master himself there. Well, one of the um, things you may know about Hans Bethe was that he was a dazzlingly fast calculator. Uh, he used his slide rule. Uh, at, at, do you remember slide rules? These things went like this. And uh, as, we said, as we said, the only thing that, that uh, limited how fast he could calculate was the Lorentz contraction of the slider as it went back and forth. <laughs> uh, well, so Chris and I had to learn to compute. And we eventually became good enough that we, he, he, he left the, the computing to us. But then we would show up with large reams of paper, of computer output. And he would then, in characteristic beta fashion, look at it, look at the stare to stare at the numbers, tables of numbers, half an hour, an hour. And finally, he would come up with a very simple way to understand the general trend of the numbers. And, but that wasn't good enough. He would then say, well, my numbers don't agree with, with their, num their numbers. Uh, how, how can we understand the difference? And so he would come up with a, a, an explanation of why his simple theory differed, w wasn't good enough. So he had the next, next order theory. And by the time, so through several iterations of this, we eventually ended up with a rather good analytic understanding of everything we were doing. And that was very typical beta style. It was really quite wonderful here. Uh, yeah, I just want to show you this, this is the, we produced this paper here on neutron star matter in 1970. It was received in 71, but we actually wrote it in fall of seven, in, in 1970. Uh, here is uh, me, Hans Bethe, in 1976, Vijay Pandey Pandey, who was a postdoc here, who really carried on the, the Beta Goldstone tradition of understanding 
properties of matter inside nuclei from first principles here. Uh, over the years, uh, beyond, after Copenhagen, uh, Hans and I stayed, stayed in good touch, uh, working on, worrying about the theory of matter at high de density, and trying to understand the interiors of neutron stars. And uh, here he is over here at a meeting we held in Urbana in 1977. Uh, he also spent a lot of time in Aspen, and in fact, um, at the Aspen Center for Physics, he donated a lot of money to them, and uh, was responsible for the building of Beta Hall. Beta Hall. And what I love is, it's not a very good photograph, but there's this drawing of, he, of him in here that one sees every time one walks in and out of the building, and it's really quite lovely to be reminded of him there. Well, uh, in addition to being a, a remarkable scientific mentor, uh, he was really a, a very good friend and, and took, took care of everybody. I remember he and his wife Rose very warmly entertained people at their apartment in Copenhagen. We went on expeditions together, and it was really quite, quite a lovely time to, sp to spend in close contact w with them. Uh, also, over the intervening years, when I got involved in writing the history of the technical history of the wartime period in Los Alamos, he was really a, a wonderful personal resource, sort of remembering every little detail of, of what, what happened there. Well, uh, as I said, he, Hans really is brought up the question of how do we understand the property of matter of high densities deep inside neutron stars. And so this, as I said, th this really began to shape the way I was looking at physics and became very involved in, in trying to understand matter under extreme conditions, and that's really what I want to talk about today, or tonight. Uh, two, two different forms of matter, which uh, are seemingly, those quite seemingly unrelated, in the end, are, uh, there, there are certain connections that, that, become, ver that become very intriguing. Uh, one is the, 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 so, so the quark gluon plasmas. These are, this is matter made in ultra-relativistic heavy ion collisions. You take big, two big atomic nuclei and you smash them together. It's a little bit like trying to study uh, interior Swiss watches by taking Swiss watches and jam smashing them together. It's not, it's not a very good way to do it, but it's the only way you can to try to study a very high density matter. Now, temperatures inside this matter are about one trillion degrees here. Typically, or in physics language, 10 to the 2 million electron volts or 10 to the 12 Kelvin. Uh, and it's in fact, this is the temperature of the early universe about one microsecond af after the Big Bang. Uh, on the other system I want to talk about are ultra-cold trapped atomics, uh, ultra-cold trapped atoms, atomic clouds. Here one can produce uh, Bose condensed superfluids, Bardeen-Cooper-Schrieffer, uh, Bardeen-Cooper-Schrieffer uh, superfluids as well, and the temperatures range here from about a millionth of a Kelvin, uh, uh, a micro-Kelvin. Kelvin is the um, Zero Kelvin is absolute zero, I'll explain in a moment. Uh, and typical temperatures are as, as low as a nano Kelvin, a billionth of a degree above absolute zero. And these systems are completely the absolute coldest places in the universe, probably. Um, you know, there might be some other, um, some distant planet we don't know about. There have been people who have been studying these systems for longer than we have and have managed to get e even colder. But you know, compared to the rest of the temperatures in the universe, th th this is phenomenally cold. And what's amazing about this, is the refrigerators, there are no real refrigerators in doing this. It's all done with lasers in, in, in ways I'll explain. Uh, so let me, let me talk a little about temperature scales to begin with. Uh, water freezes at zero degrees Celsius or centigrade, which is 273 Kelvin. Kelvin is the absolute zero. It's the coldest one you can get here. I remember once asking my TA here, Byron Janis? Janis. Byron Janis plays the piano. This is uh, Alan Janis. Uh, why, you know, w why, when the temperature went down, didn't think that, did, did you give it larger numbers than higher numbers? You know, why would you measure the cold rather than the heat? And never, I never got a good answer. Uh, anyway, so absolute zero is really where thermal motion stops. Room temperature here, well, 80 degrees, 68 degrees be better, uh, is about 300 Kelvin here. Now, in the universe, the temperature in the universe, so after the Big Bang, is about 1 billion Kelvin degrees Kelvin. As the universe expands, it cools down, and the first atoms begin to form when the nuclei and the, pro and the electrons get together at about 300 Kelvin here. 
And the present temperature of the universe is 2.7. Uh, the, now, you're probably all familiar with the Celsius scale and also the Fahrenheit scale here. Uh, it turns out that Mr. Celsius over here, uh, this, this is Celsius' original th thermometer. And if, if you can read carefully, you see there's something very wrong. The highest temperature over here is called zero. Celsius originally had water boiling at zero and freezing at 100 over here. So the, the, the scale is backwards. The Fahrenheit scale is e e equally charming. He, Fahrenheit, uh, who was a Dutch physicist, decided that the, his 100 degree mark would be the temperature of a healthy Dutch male armpit. <laughs> but he didn't have, a, he didn't have a, a, anything cold. He, he was a friend with Ole Römer in Copenhagen, the man who discovered the, this measure the speed of light from the motion of the moons of Jupiter. And R Römer reported to him, yeah, he had, he had, there was a really cold day in Copenhagen. Uh, basically, when you add salt, salt to ice, it, it no, no longer melts. I mean, it was literally a, a, a brine solution of ice, water, and ammonium chloride. And that was, he said, that'll be my zero. So the Fahrenheit scale goes from a very cold day in Copenhagen to a healthy Dutch male armpit. <laughs> okay. Now, on the scale of very low temperatures, um, you know, as we cool down, look, nitrogen becomes a liquid at 77 Kelvin. And that, of course, is a very interesting, interesting number because one would like to make superconductors that transmit electricity with no resistance at higher temperatures than this. Helium becomes superfluid at 2.17 Kelvin. And helium refrigerators work down to about a thousandth of a, of, of a degree. This is called a millikelvin. You can use various techniques with magnetic, magnetic tricks with, with magnets, with nuclei, to cool down to about a millionth of a kelvin, which is called a microkelvin. But ultra-cold atoms, which I'll talk about, really go down to a temperature of about a billionth of a, of a kelvin. So re re really cold stuff. For example, in Urbana, in Brian DeMarco is a, a young experimentalist. On his door, he has a sign, originally the coldest place in Champaign-Urbana, less than 500 nanokelvin, and then he changed it to 2.1 nanokelvin. Okay. Now, let me begin to talk about the, the actors in this whole game. There are particles. Particles come in two different kinds, uh, which some of you may be familiar with, some not. There are Fermi Dirac particles. Th this is Fermi. This is a wonderful picture of Fermi, because if you, if you look at all the equations here, they're all wrong. <laughs> Alpha, the h bar squared over ec, et cetera. Yeah. And this is Paul Dirac. Uh, now, we're very familiar with Fermi particles, because they are, cannot, you cannot put two of them in the same place at the same time. They obey what is now known as the Pauli exclusion principle. And of course, that's the reason you don't fall through your chair. I mean, the electrons in your seat don't want to be to, in the same place that the electrons in your chair are. And so you, 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 you stay quite separated here. Okay. Uh, so t examples of these particles are electrons, protons, and, and, and neutrons. On the other hand, there's another kind of particle, which are called Bose-Einstein particles, named after Bose and Einstein from 1924-25. And these are particles that don't obey the exclusion principle. And the, the nicest example of this are little, little bundles of light that are called photons. And you, in the same way, if, you, if I try to push this bottle out of the way, the, the electrons in my hand are repelling the electrons in the water bottle. I can't, I can't, can't get my finger into the bottle in any way. But if I take, just take two laser pointers, uh, up there, uh, oops, that was bad. Uh, hmm. Went away. Fantastic. Okay. Um, if I take two laser pointers, this one here and this one here, they, they don't repel each other. I mean, they, 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 the light can both be in the same place at the same time. You know, if you turn on the light, try to make the lights brighter, the other lights in the room don't get dimmer. I mean, the, the, so light, light particles can easily, easily be, have, be in the same place at the same time. Okay. Now, atoms. The, the other next ad, actor are the atoms. Typical a, atom has a nucleus in the center, electrons running around it, and this, the, the, this, these are about one billionth of an inch across. Uh, if you look closely at the nucleus, you see that it's made of neutrons, which are neutral particles, and protons, which are charged particles. And the size of the nucleus is about 100 thousandth the size of an atom itself. Now, the very interesting question here uh, that 
1926, there were Fermi Dirac statistics, particles of Bayes' exclusion principle, and Bose-Einstein, statistics is a technical word, uh, uh, and Bose-Einstein statistics, which are particles that don't obey the exclusion principle. And so the question was, what kind, what does ordinary matter obey? And so now, Mr. Dirac said, well, are the solution alone, bosons or, or Bo, Bo, Bose-Einstein particles or Fermi-Dirac particles, gives a complete description of the problem. The theory at present is incapable of deciding which solution is the correct one. And then he went on to write in this, in this beautiful 26 paper, the Fermi-Dirac solution is probably the correct one for gas molecules, since it is known to be correct for electrons in an atom, and one would expect molecules to resemble electrons more closely than light quantum. This actually is wrong. I mean, the atoms, as we'll see, come in both kinds. Uh, in fact, it was uh, Wolfgang Pauli who set out to, to study the magnetic properties of ordinary metals and decided that, indeed, uh, the, uh, indeed that the, the electrons in metals had, had to be Fermi particles, they had to obey the exclusion principle. And he wrote this very strange letter to Schrodinger, saying, with a heavy heart, I have become converted to the idea that Fermi, not Einstein Bose, is the correct statistics for electrons. That's a very peculiar statement, because the year before he had invented the exclusion principle for atoms. He said electrons and atoms, you can't put two in the same place. And now he's saying, wouldn't it have been nicer, he wouldn't have had, had as heavy a heart, if you could get two electrons in the same place in a solid. Nowadays, we associate the, the kind of particle, Bose particle, Fermi particle, with the particle itself. But back then, one didn't know that. The, 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 what people were thinking is maybe it's just a, a, a property the particle gets depending where it is. If an electron's in, in an atom, it obeys the exclusion principle. If it's in a solid, it, it, obey, it, it, it doesn't have to obey the exclusion principle. And it was really not, not for several years later uh, that this problem actually became sorted out. Yeah. Okay. So these basic building blocks of matter are, are, are fermions. The, the basic electrons at the more microscopic level, quarks, I'll tell you about. And these particles called gluons, which hold the quarks together. And the electrons are fermions, the quarks are fermions, and the gluons are bosons. Now, the question, how do you tell if a, if a given particle is a boson or fermion? What you do is you count the number of basic Fermi particles inside of it. So particles called Fermi-Dirac particles, we call those fermions. And if, it, if, they, have, if they obey Bose-Einstein statistics, we call them bosons. So if it's made from an odd number of fermions, it's a Fermi particle. If it's made from an even number of fermions, it's a Bose particle. This is, these are very simple rules, and here's some simple examples. If you look at a neutron, it's made of three quarks inside. And so there are three of these. That's odd, so it's a fermion. Proton, which has a plus charge, also has three quarks. It's also a fermion. Hydrogen atom, very simple. Hydrogen is a proton and electron going around each other. That's even number boson. Heavy hydrogen, where the nucleus is a, a deuteron, is a proton and a neutron, and an electron, that's three guys. That's a fermion. Uh, helium-4, two protons, two neutrons, two electrons. The two protons, two neutrons in the nucleus, two electrons surrounding it, that's a Bose particle. And helium-3, which is rare, but was not rare in Ithaca, because that, of course, is the system for which Bob Richardson, Dave Lee, and Doug Osterhoff got the Nobel Prize, um, is, consists of two protons, one neutron, two electrons. There's one neutron missing in the nucleus. That's a Fermi particle here. And so indeed, uh, particles come in both, both bosons and fermions here. Uh, one of the, in, in studying cold atoms, one of the principal atoms used is an alkali atom, which it consists of a nucleus, which has an odd number of particles. Uh, and, and since the, uh, in addition, there's an odd number of electrons, but go, going around it here, and uh, so if you do the arithmetic, you find uh, that depending on what the nucleus does, it's, uh, depending whether the nucleus has an even or odd number of protons, or no, where the number of neutrons in the nucleus is either even or odd, it's either a boson or a fermion. So, uh, these, so the principal actors that have been used in studying, studying low cold atoms have been alkali atoms, and most of them are, 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 are Bose particles, lithium-7, sodium-23, potassium, rubidium. And the number of Fermi alkali atoms is very, very tiny. 
In fact, the only stable one is lithium-6. And potassium-40 is pretty good. It has a lifetime of over a billion years. Does anybody know what potassium-40 potassium is also good for? It's, um, aside from being in bananas. Uh, it is actually, its radioactive decay is one of the principal, component, principal ways of heating the Earth. You know, the Earth would have cooled in, in a time, time of roughly a, a bit, one million years if there were no heat sources. And it's the radioactive decay in the deep interior of potassium, as well as uranium and thorium, that, that, that supply the, the, heat, the heat of the Earth. Potassium-40 supplies about four terawatts, four million megawatts. Okay, now let's think about studying clouds of cold atoms. Um, the original people began s s trying to develop machinery for studying large clouds of cold atoms, uh, as, as atomic gases, uh, in order to reach this, to try to make what is called Bose Einstein condensation. And uh, something I'll, I'll describe in a moment. Uh, this was a state of matter that, well, when the New York Times announced this, it's a new state of matter. All the helium physicists were familiar with this for a long time because ordinary superfluid helium is itself a, a Bose-Einstein condensate. The other, the other interesting thing one could do is cool the Fermi particles, and you produce uh, superfluid states that are very similar to superconduct, superconducting electrons in, in metals. BCSs, Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer, uh, who I'll return to in a moment. So what is this Bose-Einstein condensation? Well, you start with several of the box of particles. Hot, hot Bose particles move flying around the box. Gravity goes down. Suppose you start to cool it. What happens is a lot of the particles will begin to slow down. And fall, some will fall down to the bottom. Others will still be moving around, at large, have, have some velocity above it. But these, this collection of particles that falls down to the bottom of the box, where they're really not moving, is what is called a Bose-Einstein condensate. If you go down to absolute zero, zero Kelvin, minus 273 centigrade, the motion, in a sense, ceases completely. Now, it can't cease completely because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, but it, it, it is as, in, as, as slow as, as one can, can hope to get. Um, in fact, at these, these temperatures of nanokelvin, a billionth degree above absolute zero, the typical motion of atoms is, is about the speed of that by fingertip, something on the order of millimeter, millimeters per second, as opposed to hydrogen in the air here, which is going to kilometers per second. So how do you do these experiments? If what you do is you try to trap the atoms in a magnetic trap. And the, all these atoms are, are, are like little magnets. So, so if you remember, magnets where the poles are the same, uh, we repel each other, they're opposite, they, they attract. And so the magnetic traps, so I'll show you in a moment, uh, act like little magnets. So the, if the little magnet atoms have the south pole up and the trap magnet on the trap is, is the, North Pole up, they, they'll stay in. On the other hand, if, if you flip the, spit, flip the atom upside down so its South Pole is down, then it, it gets repelled from the trap and then they just fall away. So in this way, you, you can begin to trap atoms with, with, with a magnet. And what typical magnetic traps look like, they're, um, they're just simple coils here. This is a typical cell, so about yay big, uh, with ma magnets formed here. These are lasers. Uh, and these are really, really small tabletop appar apparatus that one does with here. Uh, the kinds of states you can get to are, if you think about what's going, if you have a trap, then the Bose particles will fall down, tend to fall down to the lowest state of the trap. And here they, they form this Bose-Einstein condensate, which is really a, 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 new, a new form of superfluid. Uh, on the other hand, if you put in Fermi particles, the, the exclusion principle comes into play. And one can only put one particle in each, in each state of the trap. You can't put two in at the same place or same time. Uh, and you begin, to, at very low temperatures, you form what's called the degenerate gas, meaning that the low energy states are all, are all filled, but there's only one particle at a time. Now you can imagine, suppose you, instead of having one, one single kind of Fermi particle, you can have two. Um, technically, there's different hyperfine states, but it's, it's some, some, some part of the particle is different. Then you could have yellow particles and blue particles. And just like electrons in a superconductor, they can pair together and, and, and become, become a superfluid here. So the kind of states you get to is very different in the two cases. Um, whoops, wrong way. OK. Um, the typical way you do experiments, you start with a warm atomic vapor, temperature, room temperature, about 3 million atoms per cubic centimeter. 
you begin to cool it down, and the cooling is, 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 be- is a beautiful method. It's where you apply is laser cooling, and the way the laser cooling works is in, uh, there, are at, there are lasers coming from six directions, and the particle tries to move this way and hits the laser. And the litmus is sort of sucked back. As if you have a crowd of people in a room who are trying to get out. Every time they start moving in some direction, somebody punches them back in. And eventually, uh, they slow down. They get exhausted. And the cool, cool down substantially. I think, let me see if I can make this thing work. Uh, uh, OK. Ta-da. OK. These, these lasers, you see the particles here. And every time they've tried to move away, they get knocked back to smaller momentum, and eventually they all cool down and just form a, a, what's called a gas in the center here. Now, of course, the way this really works uh, is good. Well, it really works is, is, is the, as it moves here, it absorbs light from, from the atom absorbs light from the laser. But the thing is, it then gives the light back eventually. And so when it gives the light back, it recoils. It ejects the light and recoils backwards. And so all the atoms eventually end up moving randomly. This final recoil motion you can't get rid of. And so the lowest temperature you can reach with la- by cooling with lasers is probably on the order of 50 micro, micro Kelvin. This is one, 50, one millionth of a, 50 millionths of a degree above absolute zero. So how do you get the rest of the way? How do, how do you do that? You do uh, evaporative cooling. Evaporative cooling, of course, everybody's familiar with. Uh, yeah. The, here. If you start with a cup of coffee here, all the hot coffee atoms leave, and eventually that's, they evaporate, and you're left with just a cup of, of cold coffee atoms here. Uh, one can see this in a very, very pretty demonstration here. Uh, I don't know why it asks me if I really want to open a file. Yes, I do. OK. Um, can you see it? Yeah. No, you can't see it. Um, this is an evaporative. This is a trap. And so what you see here, a lot, lot, lot of particles here. But at, in a moment, they, they, st- they start to leave. A, these little dots here, particles that leave. And what you'll see slowly is the number of part- Well, first of all, the, the total number is getting smaller because they're leaving. So the evaporative cooling is a little bit inefficient. You tend to lose particles from doing it. Uh, but what you notice is that they're really slowing down. It's only the fast particles that, that get to leave, and what's left over is a, a, a cool co- collection of atoms here. So, but that, that, that's the trick for getting way down, way down to the lowest temperatures here. Okay, I'll, I'll skip this. OK, so just to set the temperature scale again, um, if this is the freezing point of water here, uh, uh, nitrogen is here, liquid helium is here. We're really looking way down at the bottom of bottom pixel over here in this picture, where laser cooling takes you down to about here, and the, the uh, Bose-Einstein condensate Fermi Dirac systems are really way down in be- well below, uh, well below one millionth of, of a degree above absolute zero. Notice in in this cooling process, there's no refrigerators, no free or any of that stuff. You'd normally think of lasers as being used for heating systems. Uh, but here, rather, lasers are used in a very clever way for cooling systems here. But there's so really no moving parts in this refrigerator at all. So how do you do experiments with this? Well, what the tip traps typically are uh, about a millionth of a centimeter across, or 10 millionths of a centimeter across. Uh, I guess that's probably the size of a human hair, measured, measured crosswise. Uh, and it's too small to just take a picture of. So what you do is re- you, dr- you release it from the trap. You turn the trap off. The particles, be- the cloud begins to drop. As it drops, it expands. As it expands, you shine a laser through it and take pictures, publish the paper, and go back to do the next experiment. Th- this is a, the I- iconic picture from the first discovery of cold atom systems of at 400 nanokelvin. What you're seeing is basically uh, there are two ways to interpret this, this You're seeing in the trap the, the number of particles, density to particles. And you cool down to 200 Kelvin, you begin to form a cloud in the center. 50 nanokelvin, there's, there's much higher, most of the particles are in the center. And that's really the Bose Einstein condensate forming in the center here. Okay. Uh, when this all was done, Science Magazine declared this Bose condensate the uh, molecule of the year. And they, they pictured all these little atoms marching in lockstep together. This is the Bose condensate. 
a few of the more energetic particles running around here. Uh, then it turned out that this, of course, was not an invention. Of, it was an old invention. There was a, in the Qin Dynasty, um, from the, the famous terracotta soldiers discovered uh, this in, what, 30, 40 years ago in, in Xi'an in China, uh, one time they looked rather similar. Okay. Uh, one question. I'll show you this picture over here. We're way down at the bottom of the trap, the bottom of this bowl, why aren't all the particles exactly in the center? And the, the reason is that if they all look exactly in the center, Mr. Heisenberg tells you that if you really know their position very well, their momentum or velocity must be uncertain, they must start to move. And so what they do is they pick a sort of a compromise, a, a compromise a positions where they, uh, the position is not too well known and the velocity is, is not too well known. Both, both are a little bit uncertain. And so the clouds look spread out. In addition, the atoms repel each other, and that also makes this cloud a little bit bigger. Here. Okay. Um, one of the great tricks that's been developed since has been laser trapping, um, where you start with atoms trapped in a magnet, and you apply a, very, a laser across this. Just, well, this is a green laser, but um, this was the red laser. No, nothing more than a simple laser beam like this. And it turns out that atoms get attracted to laser beams. They like to sit here. So the, you, you for, get the cloud sitting in the, hot, in the most dense, the brightest part of the laser beam, and then you turn off the trap. And they just stay there. And in fact, this, once you do that, you can really uh, just simply use lasers alone to localize these clouds of atoms here. That's very nice. Uh, uh, just a few words about what, what's going on with these atoms. They are superfluids. If you rotate very slowly, nothing happens. You rotate fast enough, it begins to form a vortex line. And what you see here are pictures in these clouds of uh, vo real vortex lines, just like bathtub vortices forming beautiful triangular lattices in these clouds. Now, the distance across here is probably 10, 10 millionths of a centimeter. When one begins to trap Fermi particles, um, there's a beautiful picture where you can really see the difference between bosons, which can, bosons which can be in the same place at the same time. Uh, lithium-6, 7 is a boson, and lithium-6 is a Fermi particle that cannot, you cannot have two in the place, same place at the same time. When its system is hot, 810 nanokelvin. This is, this is, this is, in, this, in this game, that's, that's a hot temperature. Um, this is, the, you can see that both the bosons and fermions are spread out. You see, what you're seeing here is an actual picture of the cloud, uh, and the red part is the densest part, part. As you cool down to 500 nanokelvin, the bosons begin to compress down. The Fermi particles don't do very much. They, they still stay larger, go down to 240 nanokelvin. The Bose particles got much smaller, but the Fermi particles are much larger. These, these are really pictures where you really see whether the particles are obeying exclusion principle or not directly. Uh, what has been wonderful about these systems, they're really playgrounds for studying elementary quantum phenomena on, on a large scale. Uh, we're all familiar with water waves, uh, and water waves, you drop two rocks in water, you get waves that propagate together, they begin to interfere, and you get these wonderful interference patterns. One can do that exactly the same way with atoms in the clouds here. Uh, this is a picture where you start with a, uh, one of these condensates, you break it in half, and suddenly release the break here, and the atoms begin, these move down, these move up, and when they overlap each other, they begin to form these beautiful interference patterns. And what we're really seeing here are matter waves interfering with each other, producing the same kind of patterns as in water waves here. And so it becomes a playground for studying elementary quantum, quantum, quantum phenomena, but on fairly large-scale systems here. Uh, some games people have played have been to use uh, optical lattices, you set several lasers, and you can make uh, sort of egg, egg crates where particles tend to live, forming a, a lattice in space here. And these are very useful for future uh, attempts to use cold atoms to simulate properties of, of solids here. Because one can design these, these lattices in various ways and re really begin to study problems in solid <coughs> solid state physics, but we can begin to adjust lots of Lots, lots of things you can do, just number of particles, how tightly they're bound to the lattice, in ways that, that it's just not open in ordinary, ordinary condensed matter physics. There are many other applications. Um, for example, the quantum laser 
here from, from amazing stories. Uh, but in addition to studying quantum phenomena on large scales, what was really be beginning to enter a field where we're gaining tremendous control over atoms in ways that have never, ever been done before, and really large numbers of atoms. There's some beautiful experiments here on using atoms, on, on using co very cold atoms to control, co control much larger uh, mechanical systems here. Uh, possibly the, one could use these trapped atoms for quantum computing. There are nice experiments where you use clouds of atoms to slow light down. So where light, instead of moving at 300, whatever the speed of light is nowadays, uh, but the light can just move, rather, make it move very slowly through these clouds. Uh, possibly with atom lithography, making lasers, uh, dot, 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 you know, those question, will this cure cancer? And those are it's a serious question. But these are questions you can never begin to answer uh, you know, when, when things are done. You have to wait a while before uh, one begins to appreciate technology. OK, let, let me turn now to the question of uh, the other end of the scale, the very high, high, tech, high densities. Uh, you know that if you take atoms and you squeeze them down enough, uh, they begin, the electrons no longer become associated with a particular nucleus, but you begin to form what is a plasma. So nuclei and electrons running around here. If you take nuclei themselves and squeeze them down, squeeze them together, you begin to form a liquid called nuclear matter. And this happens sort of the inside of a big supernova explosion where a, a, a core is left that eventually compresses down to form a neutron star. And the atom, the nuclei are squeezed together and form a liquid. Now, in addition, the nucleons themselves, the neutrons and protons, are made of quarks inside. And you squeeze that still further, you end up with a liquid that could, is really where what's running around are the quarks themselves here. So the basic progression you see is that as you compress matter to form, as you compress matter, you begin to form new states. At, atoms compress form a plasma, nuclei compress form nuclear matter, nuclear matter compress forms quark matter here. And so, um, I, should, I should remind you from just what the uh, quarks look like. They're, they're, they come in fanciful names, up, down, strange, charm, beauty, truth, tr beauty or bottom, top or truth. They have a fractional charge of an electron. And the principal ones we're interested in here are the lighter three quarks, the up, down, and strange quarks. Uh, one can make protons and neutrons out of all the elementary particles. Um, and as I mentioned, in the form of baryons in the early universe before, before a microsecond. Uh, and here's sort of a picture of the expansion of the universe, the Big Bang. And in this period here um, up, of about a microsecond time, time is increasing this way, one has quarks where the liquid or quarks running around. Here you begin to form nuclei, uh, nucleons, nuclei, and eventually people and such. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one can look at a phase diagram. Well, what does matter look like well, uh, as a whole? Temperature versus density. And sort of we live way down here. The inside of nuclei are much denser there about here. Uh, but as you go to high temperatures or high densities, you eventually reach matter where the quarks and gluons become the principal actors in the problem. And they move around the, uh, out here. And we're further inside. You have just hot, hot gases of neutrons and protons. Neutron stars should be someplace along here as, as well. OK. Um, how, how can one begin to study these problems? And this, this is the question Hans always raised. How do you get to, how, do you, how, do you, how can you begin to measure what's going on deep inside neutron stars by doing experiments? And so, we thought of building this heavy ion collider. Actually, the whole project began at Aurora College, Wells College in Aurora, just 30 years ago. Um, T.D. Lee, the great physicist, um, had a, his idea of how to do this. Nuclei as heavy as bulls through collision generate new states of matter. You basically take big atomic nuclei, smash them together, and look at the matter that's formed. Uh, I noticed the Japanese have another version of this. Um, <laughs> smashing the other um, large, states, large states here. OK, now, practically, um, the Brookhaven, I was very involved in the building of the Brookhaven Relative Physics and Heavy Ion Collider, uh, which we started in 1983. And it's by the year 2000, there were the first beams. And what you see here, if I can uh, get this going, yeah, 
Um, here's, here's the nucleus, comes here, goes around, the boom. Uh, I'll do it again, it's fun. Um, no, wrong. Um, yeah. So the nuclear injected here, they start here, they accelerate in the, what is called the AGS, the alternating gradient synchrotron. They get ejected into the RIT going two ways, and, they've, and there's different collision points where, where they collide together. Um, and that's where one studies. Okay. So, eh, doesn't want to work. No, okay. Okay, you've seen it. <laughs> That's it. Okay, what is going on in these, in these collisions between these nuclei here? Well, these nuclei are really moving at energies which is 100 times their rest mass. They're, they're, so they're really very, very Lorentz contracted. So they look like very narrow pancakes. They collide together. They pass through each other because they don't have time to break up and uh, have different pieces. But they're, they're strongly excited. But left behind is what is called this quark gluon plasma, a very excited state of the vacuum. And so the picture theorists have of what's going on is here's the nuclei are coming away from each other, the white things here, and this is the quark gluon plasma left in between. Uh, but if you're an experimentalist, you see a very different picture. You see this picture. And what you see here is th this is some kind of chamber, it's a real photograph of a streamer chamber, where you just see hundreds, thousands of, of the tracks of particles coming out. And it's a very difficult game. If you want to learn what matter is doing at high densities, you have to study all these tracks, trace back into here, and sort of begin to invent some picture of what is going on over here. But as I said, this turns out to be the only way that one can study the properties of very, very, very dense matter here. Um, here is the size of the machines. These are detectors at, at Brookhaven, uh, the Phoenix detector, the star detector, and here are people. And this is, you know, these, these detectors are things the size of this room, if not larger. Um, and then at the LHC, which has been going for years, over a year now, um, there's a, one the detector devoted solely to heavy ions, that's Alice, that's, that's the mandatory person, that's Alice herself. Uh, and, but the other, all the other detectors, Atlas and CMS, also are looking at, at heavy ion collisions. Um, Alice is very nice. The, the, um, it's actually, actually an acronym for a large ion collider experiment. It really works. <laughs> um, and, but the, here's a nice a certain cartoon of what's going on at Alice. Um, the, it's cooking the soup of quarks and gluons together over here. So, okay. uh, the, this, the scale of physics here is very, very different from the cold atom physics. This is cold atom physics. This is a graduate student in, in Brian DeMarco's lab. And this is the experiment. It's, it's all this very simple thing over here. This is the, the, mag, the trap is over here. All the atoms one's studying are right in here. Two very, very different scales of experiment. Um, just a few observations of what has been seen at RIC uh, so far, and also at the LHC. Uh, one, is, one is certainly producing matter at very high energy densities. This didn't happen to be. Have to be. It could be that the nuclei just passed through each other, went out the other side, and nothing happened at all. Uh, however, they, there's a lot of energy transfer, and you, one begins to make matter at energies which are like 10 or 30 times the energy density inside an ordinary atomic nucleus, and the energy there is really just the, primarily the rest mass of, of, of the particles that, that are in there. So one's making really high energy density matter, and this is the stuff that the early universe is made out of. Yeah. Um, and so one is certainly making quark gluon plasma. The hard thing is, how, how do you probe it? How do you, re, how do you really discover its properties? But that's, that's a whole long, long story. One thing that's been found is that the particles indeed interact very strongly together. It's very, very, very um, dense, dense, opaque matter that's formed here. Okay. Now, what I just want, in, in, the, in the remaining few minutes, I want to just discuss a couple of connections between quark matter and the ultra cold atom, atom game over, over here. Uh, there's a, actually a whole list of, of different connections one can make, but one is the, the nature of the states of, of the two systems that they go through as, as they're tickled in various ways are, have some great similarities. Um, and another completely unexpected result is both systems are the least viscous sy systems known, in, re relatively least viscous systems, the closest to perfect liquids that there are. The matter made it 
ultra, ultra relativistic heavy ion collisions, the quark matter, and the ultra cold atoms here. Um, now, there's a very, rather similar evolution um, in cold atoms. Um, as you increase the, as you start with the gas of Fermi atoms, uh, and what they'd like to do, if, if there's a very strong interaction between the atoms, is they'd like to form little molecules here. This, 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 these are bosonic molecules. Let's see, you have two different kinds of fermions, so they can be together. Um, they'd like to form just diatomic molecules. As you weaken the strength of the interaction, of the attraction between them, they are not tightly bound together. And they, these atoms, these pairs of atoms become much larger in size. And eventually, if they if the, make the interaction weak enough, one gets what is called the, the Bardeen Cooper Schrieffer state of superconductivity or superfluidity. This is what the, the Cornell people got the Nobel Prize for in liquid helium, um, where these pairs, the, the original pairs here, which are close together, are now become very far apart and many pairs in between. It turns out that this, this picture has been very, very suggestive to try to understand what is going on among quarks of high density. In particular, as you increase the density of matter here, um, at low densities, relatively, you know, these are enormously high densities, but relatively low inside the neutron stars, um, one has gases of neutrons and protons. As you go up, they begin to overlap, and you go into a state where you form basically di diatomic molecules. These are diatomic molecules of quarks. They're called diquarks, technically. And as you go further up in density, uh, one begins to get into this Cooper pair regime here. So there's really a fairly good um, analogy between what seems to be happening in these two states here. But were it not for knowledge of what was going on in the cold atoms, we really wouldn't have developed a, this, this picture over here very well. Here. Uh, and so I think we're beginning to get some new insight into neutron stars that instead of having a, a core in the center, a liquid core here, and then a core, a quark matter in the deep center, what is probably happening is that as one goes further in from the crust of the neutron star, this is 10 kilometers, there's first a liquid of neutrons and protons go further in, they begin to overlap here, and eventually it, it turns smoothly into quark matter over here. Pictures, as I want to stress, pictures that would not have been developed were not for understanding what was going, going on in cold atoms. The last topic I'll mention in the last moments is the viscosity, the very, very unex completely unexpected result. Uh, Friction in the everyday world is very common. It's also very useful you know, for driving up hills or um, climbing or starting fires uh, or an example of when um, friction would, would have been useful. <laughs> um, now, f there's friction in liquids as well. And the friction in liquids is called viscosity. And so we're all familiar with pouring, pouring very, very viscous liquids. It takes they, they start to dribble out and form drops and just splashing down. Uh, viscosity, of course, makes it more difficult to drink through a straw because the liquid going up through the pipe is sort of having friction against the edges of, of the straw. Uh, glaciers move very slowly, uh, what's left of them, at any rate. Um, if you're familiar with making coffee in such a coffee pot over here, you know, when you try to press down the coffee, you put, you put it coffee grounds, put in boiling water, and then you start to press it down and try to push the grounds away. And it's really the viscosity of water going through the coffee grounds that makes it very hard to push. You can imagine making superfluid helium coffee where you um, just press it bloop, right down. Um, or lava lamps, which some people have. Well, um, it turns out that, that in quark matter in hip, that's made in heavy ion collisions, as well as the ultra-cold atomic gases, they have very, very, very low viscosities. Um, you can think of viscosity if you have two plates over here. One is fixed, and you fill it up with some goo in between. And you ask, how hard is it to move the upper plate over here? And really what's happening, technically, is um, it's atoms moving from the bottom plate up to the top plate that the atoms, as they move up, convey the information to the bottom plates at rest. And they hit here, and they try to slow, the, the, slow this plate down, makes it difficult to pull the plate. And that's really viscosity. 
Now it turns out, and this is somewhat counterintuitive, that um, if the particles are very weakly interacting among each other, the system is very viscous. And that's because the particle can very easily move from the bottom plate and tell the top plate that, it, that it's moving, transfer its momentum to the top plate here. So if particles are very strongly interacting among each other, the system, systems are very, have very low viscosity. So the question is, how small can viscosity get? Now, at this point, a complete surprise came, uh, which is a funny result from string theory. String theory, which I'll not tell you anything about, is believed by some cult sect of, high, of physicists to be the answer to everything. Uh, it probably might be. Um, and what emerged from, from a particular string theory was a very strange prediction. Uh, entropy is a measure of disorder in the system here. Uh, you don't need a detailed description of it, but everything's neatly lined up. It's low entropy. It's a mess. It's very high entropy. Yeah. Um, what people measure, what, what the theory predicts, is that if you take the ratio of the viscosity to the entropy, it, it can never be arbitrarily small, but it must be at least it must be some universal constant or bigger. This universal constant is Planck's constant of action divided by four pi. Now, the question comes: Look at ordinary substances. Look at water nitrogen, liquid helium, and stuff. What you find is water, uh, his liquid helium, this water is about 30 in, in some, in, on this scale of h, o, h bar over 4 pi, or just h bar. Water is about, this ratio of, of viscosity to entropy is about 30. Uh, other substances, nitrogen, water, uh, nitrogen here, they, they're also very high. This is viscosity, and this is temperature. Um, if you look at liquid helium, it gets down to about 0.7. That's somewhat lower. But quark matter, as well as cold atoms, where one actually can measure these, these viscosity to entropy ratios, get down to 0.2 to 0.4 over here. There's a way to understand this, which is not quite right uh, for physicists, which is saying that this limit, um, when you get all the way down here, the mean free path, the, the distance a particle can go without colliding into something else, can never be smaller than the distance between the particles. That turns out that's not actually true. But uh, that, that, that simple picture can, can begin to explain why there should be a, a bound to this, a lower bound to the viscosity. Well, people have done this experiment in heavy ions. In heavy ions, what they do, it turns out, you know, in an accelerator, you want to aim so they exactly hit, but it's very hard to do that. Sometimes they collide and they have glancing collisions. When they're glancing collisions, What's left over, here's a glancing collision, what's left over is a blob in the center, which is not very symmetric, it's, it's elongated. By measuring the elongation and how, how the elongation evolves, you can begin to get some notion of the viscosity of the matter. And from the, these experiments that have been done at Rick, one is deduced that the, this ratio of viscosity to entropy is about two to three times, only two to three times larger than this fundamental limit. That's very, really way down there. That's the, what it was at the time the, the most, the least viscous substance relative to the entropy that was ever discovered here. In fact, Brookhaven got very excited about this. And so they, Brookhaven, where, the, where Rick the collider was, and they made coffee mugs that they gave out, which said, a uh, picture of a heavy ion collision said, Rick serves the perfect fluid. The perfect fluid in the sense that systems without viscosity are, are, have always been known as perfect fluids here. Now, similar experiments have been done in uh, cold atom systems here. And what you do is you start, start out there with a cloud of atoms, like this, and you start it oscillating, boom, 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 and you watch it slowly damp out. And it, it, the oscillation, the, the, the pulsation damps out as a consequence of the viscosity, and one can measure the viscosity there. And indeed, uh, in very strongly interacting clouds of fermion, atomic fermions, one finds a viscosity and entropy ratio of about 0.3 to 0.5, compared to this absolute lower limit of 0.08. So there's a very surprising connection uh, that both the ultra-cold atoms and the very hot clouds of quarks both are, are systems with the lowest viscosity and entropy ratios in the universe here. Completely, completely unexpected, and also th that it was suggested by string theory, also completely unexpected here. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's one of the beautiful results that has emerged from string theory. And it's forced people really start thinking in other parts of physics here. 
with, without that result in the string theorists, one never would have really asked this question. Yeah. Uh, what, one reason that they, it's not that there's really a, a fundamental deep down connection, but what you're seeing in both these systems is the fact they're both very, very strongly interacting. And very, very strongly interacting systems have very low viscosity here. So they're among the most strongly interacting systems known in nature here. Okay. These, these are just two of the connections. There, there are others discussing states of superfluidity and such that, 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 that I could talk about, but the hour is running on. Um, and so just, just to conclude, I think uh, what discusses these two state, new states of matter, quark gluon plasmas, quark matter, and ultra cold atomic gases. And the, the, the temperature scales are very different between the two. Uh, a factor of 10 to the 20, which is 1 followed by 20 zeros, and I hope that I got the right number here. Um, you know, the, the quark matter, the, the hottest systems made on Earth, you know, te temperatures of 100, of, of, of a billion degrees Kelvin, down to, temper down to the cold atom systems, which have temperatures of a billionth of a degree or so. But the, what's emerged from this are just many, many um, surprises and similarities between, between these systems at these two, two separate scales. And I really think that Hans Bader would have been absolutely delighted to, to, to be seeing what the, how this whole development played out, which, which again, I think he was really deserved a tremendous thank you for me, at least, for getting me into this game this way. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, before calling for questions, I wish to announce, I, I've been ordered to announce, uh, that there will be, after the question period, a reception with many good things to eat, to which you are all invited, in room 401, 401. in the <laughs> physical sciences building over there, the big, new, shiny, beautiful the physics building on the fourth floor. Got that? Got it. Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, we have some time for some questions. Do I hear a question? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. Comment? Query? Here. Uh, you, you hinted that there was a connection between string theory and quark gluon plasma, and that there's a connection between quark gluon plasma and super, and super cold liquid. Does that imply that there's a connection between string theory and super cold liquid? That's a, that's a, that's a nice question. Um, people don't know. I mean, one thing, the, um, the string theorists play this game called holography otherwise known as the anti sitter space conformal field theory uh, correspondences. And they play, what they do is they take a model of a field theory, uh, or, or, or black holes in five dimensions, they, and they try to deduce ordinary, simple garden variety physics. For example, by this method, they've, they've proven that nuclei must be bound together, that neutrons and protons would bind together. And I think that, that, that's a very powerful result. Why there are these connections is not understood. There are uh, predictions that are dealing with uh, gases of Fermi particles uh, that look very much and roughly like what one sees. But how these connections, where these connections are happening is, is a really a complete mystery. And this is, it's one of the... Whether it would actually pan out to be very useful or not in the long run, I don't know. It's, it's, it's certainly very suggestive that there are things going on there. I guess yes. I would ask, uh, has, has the information that Rick has provided been folded into early theories of the universe to help, for, for instance, understand inflation? Because if you suddenly have uh, very, very different viscous properties, you might think that it would have an impact on the evolution of the early universe. Um, that's, 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 that's a very good question. And the answer is probably not. Because Rick is really studying matter well, you know, something the, around a microsecond after the Big Bang. The temperatures which are uh, you know, 100 MeV at 10 to the 12th Kelvin 
whereas the inflation period is really a fa factor of 1,000 more before that temperature. And that one has not gotten there. The LHC, heavy ion collisions of the LHC get a little bit higher, but one was not really a, capable of probing matter, a, a, dense, a, a volume of matter at, at those temperatures at all, either the LHC or the Rick. Okay. Astronomers provided any new information about neutron stars recently that, uh, or are you hopeful? Ah, uh, come to my talk tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not giving a talk tomorrow. The answer is yeah. <laughs> you know, there's a very, very wonderful thing that's going on, uh, which, have, which is that astronomers are beginning to measure neutron stars. With, they, know, they know about mass, about masses. The largest mass is just under two solar, twice the mass of the sun. But there are also measurements of radii as well. Now, if you want to get a, a, a star of a certain size and a certain mass, what the stuff you make it of, the, or what we technically call the equation of state, is, is very constrained. And so by measuring mass and radii, one can begin to learn you know, how stiff the matter is inside, how hard it is to compress in various densities. And this is a really a beginning, these get, what was learning from uh, observations of mass and radii is, is beginning to agree very well with calculations we're doing of what the equation of state should, should look like. And so a much more consistent picture is beginning to emerge, which I think is very exciting. You playfully said, I think, that the uh, clusters of super cold uh, particles like to stay in the hottest part of a laser beam or the brightest part of a laser beam. Yeah. Is that also an absorption re-emission phenomenon, or could you say something about that? Not really. <laughs> um, it's just, it, if, 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 light, if an atom likes to emit, emit light it, it's with a certain frequency, and atoms do, uh, then if you try a laser that's just below that frequency, then, 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 the, then the atom's attracted to the laser. If the frequency of the laser is slightly above, slightly blue shifted from the resonant thing, then the atom is repelled. And, but that, that, that gives one a fantastic way of controlling atoms. You know, just, just by dialing the, 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 the color of the light you shine on. And I, I gave the example of being able to control clouds of atoms, but it's also used if you want to have a cloud of atoms and you want to make a hole in it. I guess I showed this, this laser that's cut, this cloud that's cut in two. Uh, what, when I showed the picture of interference, you shine a blue shifted laser, slightly blue with the resonance, the atoms are repelled. Is there no upper limit to the temperature? Um, can are we no upper limit in the, any to how high you get? Period. No. Um, well, I guess at a certain point you probably get so high that our our knowledge of physics begins to break down. But um, no, there, there should there, there should not be. It's, it's, that's a tough question. <laughs> Publish the answer in 20 years. <laughs> uh, I, I recognize myself for uh, for a question. The the kinds of collisions at the Large Hadron Collider that uh, I reported on the front page of the New York Times are extremely rare events. Yeah. Right? They, they, they have to look through billions and billions of collisions. Gazillions. Zips. <laughs> to, uh, to find them. Yeah. Uh, is this true also with the heavy ion collisions at Brookhaven? No, 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 no. Um, I mean, you, you switch, sp smash two big nuclei together, they form this glob of goo. And you all, learn something. All the time. Any old glob. Yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, That's a lot easier. yeah. Well, what, what, no, but one of the problems is, you know, any given collision may make twenty thousand particles, mm -hmm. and you've got to make detectors that are capable of, of not being burnt out uh -huh. prematurely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, I'm Where are you? Up here. Okay. <laughs> How does the entropy of the quark matter plasmas compare with the entropy levels of the uh, ultra cold atom super 
Oh, uh, the entropies in, in the quarks are, because the temperatures are a zillion times higher, so are the entropies. They're, they're, they're very, very large. But the, instant, the, the thing about the cold atoms is in this both columns in the condensed phase, that's really a phase with zero entropy at all. It's a, it's a, it's a completely ordered state. You know, unlike the, the atoms in the room, which you were running on randomly, in, in, in the Bose Einstein state, they're really all very neatly al al aligned, in, in very highly ordered state. One cannot, in the, in, when you, in the quark law plasma game, you can never get in a state that, that, that is, is uh, completely ordered. You, cannot get to, you can't get to low entropy states. In fact, because the quarks have, have a, lo a lot more a lot more internal states, a lot, lot more what we call degrees of freedom, uh, it, the entropy tends to be, at a given temperature, the entropy tends to be substantially higher than the entropy of, ord of ordinary matter. So they're, they're both going in opposite directions. Thank you. One more question. Yes? Going back to the question he had about the upper limit of yeah. the temperature, um, like what would happen like if you had like the limit of uh, you know a, a, a near infinite dense uh, substance moving at near the speed of light? Would that like approach like uh, some in, or limit of temperature or? Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, certainly if, if if I have something like the sun moving towards you, I, I won't hit you. Don't worry. If the sun moving towards you, the, the light will look bluer, and you say, ah, oh, the temperature is really higher. Yeah. But that, that's, that's only, that's only through, through because of the Lorentz effects. I mean, temperature is really only well-defined for, for systems that are sitting still here. Uh, what was your, say, say your question again. Well, I was just wondering if, 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 if you had, like, you know, infinite energy, or the highest possible energy, if you had you know, a particle of infinite density or, or a substance of infinite density moving in near the speed of light, would that approach like some upper limit for temperature? I, I guess what, what happens is it, it, as you, you get, put more and more energy into a system, what, 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 what one of these pictures showed is that you, as you compress or, or mix the system more energetic, it, it, you get many more parts. And so the, where the system will go is you add more and more energy, really depends upon what are the internal parts in the system. Now, the present picture is that quarks are, are it. There are no subquarks. That may be completely wrong. I mean, it may be that sufficiently high energy you discover that picture be, begins to break down. There's no evidence of it so far. It, it'd be a fantastic discovery. OK, well, I'm sure Gordon will be happy to answer further questions at the reception. At the reception, <laughs> yes. Room 401. Physical science, <laughs> to which you're all invited. And thank you very much. For thank you.